in tandem with the mechanics and that sort of stuff, that is what the version that the randomizer is based on. And so you will be seeing those later into the match here. Speaking of that, we are in uh, version 29 of the randomizer currently, so it's been through quite a lot. Um, obviously, we mentioned Christos Owen has helped develop it, but we're going to get started here. Um, looks like the uncle here is going to give us an interesting message today. Yeah, I wasn't able to quite catch that, but finger webs in the very first chest. The flippers, they can now summon water, and so using a trick like fake flippers isn't really a thing, but uh, it does open up some areas when they do get out of the escape area here. Yeah, so unfortunately we lose the opportunity to talk about a fun little bit of speed tech, but not a problem. Uh, flippers are very handy for a few specific locations in the game. Uh, typically Swamp Palace, which has six items that we can find in that dungeon. And of course, um, various other things that are faster to check, um, including the uh, the hobo under the bridge. But we're going to start with a weapon from the uncle today, um, which will be bombs. Yeah, in this version, while you do go through escape like the classic game, the starting weapon that you get from uncle is actually randomized between a pool of uh, miscellaneous other weapons. And so the only weapon that does not have any real strong logical implications is actually bombs. And so having 10 bombs here, they have to make it all the way through escape with these bombs. And they also want to make sure that they hold on to at least one, preferably more, when they get near the end, because there is a bomb wall with three uh, chests, potential items for them at the end. And then of course, you know, bombs are just handy in general. Yeah, and we've seen several people in this tournament actually lose their uh, tournament, uh, well, very important matches in their tournament destiny in the Swiss rounds where we were kind of thin in the herd a bit. Uh, due to not being able to check that item immediately. So very important, as uh, Giselle Schaff just mentioned, to be careful with their bombs. And I think you kind of um, did some tutorials for these, actually, didn't you? Yeah, there's a lot of great resources on the internet. Um, optimizing your stress to save time is really important. Like in the stream that Hippo is currently in, uh, having a little issue with Christos, but don't worry, we'll get that sorted out. But uh, yeah, that one guard uh, is very tricky. You need two bombs to take out these blue guards, or of course, one pot as Hippo does. Uh, taking out the enemy to try and get a little bit of an extra farm here. But yeah, through this skip, there's not too much. You really, um, as a minimum, want to have at least five, you know, want to use five bombs. In this room here, you can just plant a bomb and then react to what the soldier does. Um, you can see Hippo doing that and uh, <laughs> just holding the bomb, make sure he lands the hit. But yeah, the green soldiers take one bomb, blue take two, and here we have Chris is back. And a nice little sort of sink here as we get the fleet. And on top of that, with some really awesome looking uh, bomb placements, as you were just talking about, the flute is a really interesting item. It's one of our best uh, means to accessing the rest of Hyrule. We can use it once we've activated it in the town uh, to go to one of eight locations in the light world. Uh, of course, it doesn't do anything for us in the dark world, except it's a pretty fun instrument. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, kind of have a tradition when we activate it, uh, being the Hyrulean National Anthem, but uh, right now, yeah, it's mostly for transport, but later it will have more logical implications, um, but we still need some more items in order to bring that into play. And we saw both of our runners uh, pick up two pots to kill the uh, ball and chain guard guarding uh, Zelda's cell here. It takes eight you know, slashes if you had a sword to kill him, but this is really the only weapon we want to be using. Uh, having four and five bombs respectively as we enter the back half of escape is a much more comfortable position to be in. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the pots are very convenient, as you said. Um, two of them will take out the, ch the ball and chain guard, uh, eight sword slashes. Um, the time it actually takes to grab the pots isn't that much different from sword slashes. Uh, it is more optimal to do that. And really, that's kind of what you're going to see between a lot of players is they'll do different strategies and they'll have different, uh, you know, varying amounts of time saved. But uh, um, having a quite a blue seed here, we've got flippers, flute, and the blue mail. So I don't know, Kena Burna, another blue item, maybe not too far from the table here. Perhaps these folks should be listening to a soundtrack in the background from old Blue Eyes talking about Blue Moon. Um, I don't know if you guys are Frank Sinatra fans out there, but it seems apropos right now. Yeah, oh, most definitely. Also, we um, see in the speedrun normally and in Randomizer, we talk about this uh, segment we called Escape just a moment ago. Uh, we're escaping from the castle with Zelda, makes sense. We'll end up in the sanctuary um, in the back half of this. It takes about six minutes generally. I think they're going to be about 6.30, maybe a little bit less than that in this situation. Yeah, in the speedrun, uh, the mark of a good player is getting under six minutes 
and for every second under six minutes, it's kind of a testament to your overall knowledge of movement and game mechanics and how you just go through. In Randomizer, um, there's no text boxes and there might be some farming. You still typically want to aim for under six minutes. Uh, if you're under six minutes, I would still say that's pretty decent uh, Randomizer time. You know, some conjecture that having a six minute escape really just means you reset a lot. Yeah, in the, in the speedrun, um, if you get six minutes, kind of like, well, I can't PB with that six there. I'm just, like, you just don't look as cool. <laughs> but uh, even though over the scope of the game, it's really only a couple of seconds, but it's, it's kind of the narrative it seems to be in the very beginning. Yep, uh, typically it would take about an hour and a half or so for a very good speedrunner to finish this game. So we may actually see a race that's faster than that. Um, with the bombs here, though, uh, Hippo's got to be careful. He's got one left after this, so oh, that was really we'll good. be able to check it. Yeah, he has exactly one bomb, so he does not want to get hit by a rat, otherwise it might screw up his throw, but it looks like he is completely fine, has his bomb, and it's for good measure. The bow, the bow is huge. Not only is it a great weapon, but one of the beginning areas of the overworld that you can clear out is Eastern Palace. Uh, while you do need the lantern in order to access, you know, in order to logically go through the dark rooms, the bow at least lets you complete it if you're familiar with the dark rooms. So in terms of routing, it can make things very uh, simple or even lazy if you're not sure, you know, how you want to go or you want to fish for more items before a more complex decision is made. Well, I'm, so I'm wondering if we've already found a map because if we have, yep, we could yeah. have skipped this chest. <laughs> yeah, so. Every dungeon has its items completely randomized. It still has the dungeon items though. So basically if a dungeon has five chests and one of them is a map and compass, they'll still have a map and compass. Those three chests can be anything. And of course, the more items you get, the more of a direction you get pushed into. So reading the logic and knowing where to go is very important. And you know, not only is it that, but then your own decisions as a player, your own skills, you know, it can it can all lead into a very different route or narrative that both players go through. Yeah, and uh, having that knowledge saved uh, Hippos um, exactly three seconds on Christos there. Um, we're also getting some more knowledge here. Going into the forest, you can actually pull in certain trees here in Hyrule, and depending on the number of enemies you've killed, one through four, and whether you've taken damage, you'll get a certain item from the tree. Um, in the original game, it's rupees of certain tiers. In this uh, randomizer, it's, you know, random. Uh, so sometimes you'll get bombs from that, and it's worth checking while you're, while you're heading your way through the forest here. Uh, nothing else too exciting we've picked up yet here. Yeah, should also be noted that I did mention logic and Eastern and Dark Rooms, but really the, the idea is that you get different items and they open up different parts of the world. So in terms of the items, there's a logical progression. You will not soft lock in the game. The developers have made it so that, you know, regardless of the items and randomization, you will be able to finish the seed. However, you can do some sequence breaks in the game. So for example, Within the game's code and logic, you need the lantern in order to enter a dark room, um, places like entering Death Mountain and you know certain places in dungeons. Logically, you would need the lantern, but if a player is skilled, they can forego that and just go straight into the mountain. However, to go along with that, with their mental idea of routing and understanding, they need to keep you know keep mind of that because sometimes it can help you pinpoint items or rule out where items may be. Yeah, and you mentioned before um, that we're playing on the Japanese 1.0 version. Also worth noting, uh, Hippo did buy bombs here just to be stocked. But the 1.0 version gives us access to a few glitches that can be used. Uh, we call minor glitches in the, the Link to the Past community. Uh, that will allow us to potentially get around certain things. Um, doing rooms in the dark without the lantern is a skill-based thing, as you mentioned, Giselle Shaft. Ooh, we got a mirror. Uh, but we could potentially use water walking as one type of glitch to... Um, forego some of those logical requirements. Yeah. So should we know that um, in terms of routing in the beginning of the game, uh, there's only a few places you can really go. You do have some options. Oh, I'm sorry. Please I rise to the Hyrule really National Anthem. <laughs> and of course, we lose the audio on that right then. Uh, but you were hearing the docile <laughs> tunes of the duck, the swag duck, whatever you want to call this uh, bird friend of ours. Probably the most useful companion that uh, Link and all of his journeys has ever had. Certainly doesn't pester us with a hey, listen, or anything. Yeah, and of course, it's just like a fun community thing where you activate, you know, the bird, you have to listen to a fanfare. And so it's kind of like a little bit of a mini cut scene. You know, you could, you know, check your Twitter, have a break, or whatever. But, uh, you know, just kind of a fun thing. Salute and chat. 
uh, should you choose to. But yeah, it should be known, both these players, um, in terms of the beginning route, going to Kakariko, this town here, is very common. There's a lot of little items like this. Uh, of course, in the normal game, they're a bit more junky, but in Ranto, it could be quite anything, uh, notwithstanding the mirror, which is a very important item. The mirror is probably one of the most important items in terms of Rando because um, as you go through the world, you have access between the light and the dark world. And with the mirror, you can use that to consolidate options and route them together at the same time. So it's a very powerful routing tool. As well, it can let you warp to the beginning of a dungeon if you use it. Uh, so in terms of you know dungeon routing and speed, it's just a very nice tool to have. Yeah, and in regards to how this uh, mirror will function, we can only use it when we're in the dark world to go to the light world. We can't do it the other way around. So. In a lot of situations, once we have access to the Dark World, we're going to try to go to certain places in the map, or in the overall world of Hyrule, that'll allow us to do two things at once, um, as you mentioned, consolidating some of these checks. Um, I'm curious to see is what will be our access to the Dark World, or where our uh, Moon Pearl, for example, will be. Uh, this will allow us to not be in bunny form uh, when we're walking around the Dark World. Looks like Christos Owen has uh, found bombs at the race game, though. He's going to use that flute right away to head towards Eastern Palace. That makes a lot of sense. Again, he knows logically he cannot finish it, but between Saw Charlie here, um, he will have three items, and then Eastern itself can have three items. With the bow being full completable, he has no worry of, you know, missing any items. I don't even think we got a map check though, so he's quite confident in this route here, which makes a lot of sense again. Six items. Yeah, having the bow seems like a very smart um, reason to be over here. This is one dungeon that is locked by the bow. Um, you would typically in the vanilla game get this in this dungeon. Uh, so having it's a requirement, and we get the lamp too, which really points us into that That's dungeon. very convenient, absolutely. So Eastern fully in logic, and as a racer you think, okay, well, now I got the lantern, I have a bow. Is the game telling me that my progression will be in Eastern? Um, not necessarily, but again, it's all about building information, building logic. You're trying to do things quickly uh, with an informed mind, and uh, you'll see Hippo's taking a different route here, going to South Shore. Um, he's opening the damn area and it's rewarded with a fire source, a different fire source, not, you know, unlike the lamp, you have the fire rod, which actually is needed uh, for turtle rock and skull woods. So not a lot of progression here, but a fire source does come in very handy. And again, another potential weapon. I'm a little confused though. Um, that's got to be a little waterlogged. Do you think that like, if you put a lighter under the water, like it doesn't work? I'm wondering if he's going to have any issues with that, <laughs> having found it underneath the dam there. Uh, but in all seriousness, though, it's one of the most powerful weapons that we can uh, have access to. So he's going to use it to good effect here to get at least one of these mini moldorms. Yeah, these mini moldorms can be tricky to hit. Um, so I guess again, in terms of going into routing, Chris just went straight into Eastern. It seems like a very obvious, you know, play. It's like, well, why don't you just go to Eastern? You know, why is Hippo going to South Shore? You know, here checking this cave. You know, both areas have a lot of items. But I suppose part of the hope is with the mirror, you might be thinking, well, if I do get access to the Dark World, how's the darkness is in the same area as Eastern? So I might actually be able to leave Eastern until later to pair it. But uh, Chris is actually going to be rewarded for not planning too far ahead in terms of that play. Uh, he will get the boots here. So again, just, you know, not overthinking it, going for a very straightforward, you know, simple, smart play. Gets the boots, which are a very uh, important item, more so early on, but. Yep, you get your most value if you can use them for the longest. In terms of uh, Link's movement, animation uh, we usually alternate at a speed of two to one pixels per frame when you're dashing it's four per frame so it's a lot quicker than doing anything else um and on top of that 13 minutes into the um you know the race here it looks like uh christos can finally get the run started right <laughs> yeah so to speak but like you mentioned um link's movement it's it, like the movement mechanics are a little strange uh link's movement oscillates two one pixels a frame so you know, for sake of ease, you go about 1.5 pixels a frame. The boots, four pixels a frame. So a little bit over double. When you move diagonal, you're going one pixel in either direction. So for a net gain of two. So, you know, in terms of movement, making sure you're maximizing dashes and stuff. Little time savers that can really add up over run. And here in the semifinals, every single frame counts. It's uh, absolutely critical that you know, our runners take advantage of every opportunity they can to move quicker. They have to assume that their opponents are doing, or their opponent is probably doing something very similar to themselves. Um, even though the, we do see some divergence on our end, at this level and this caliber of uh, player, there's really not a lot of opportunity to hope that your opponent made a bad decision. 
yeah, a lot of things can be subtle. We did find Aether, a uh, screw attack Franklin badge on the island there. So with the mirror, they can get to that item, but they first need Dark World access. But with the flippers in the mirror, uh, that it's soon to be in logic. But uh, yeah, Hippo's going to continue making his way through Zora. Chris is still in Eastern, so again, you know, Hippo's getting a lot of quick checks here, but uh, Eastern being a crystal makes it progression. So, you know, even though it seems like, you know, he's not really finding as many items, he is progressing just as much. Yep, I think, um, ooh, that was a hook shot. I feel like this is every single movement advantage we could possibly have right now. Yeah, this is very good. Um, hook shot, very handy. Um, uh, with the flute, they can logically access Death Mountain. They don't have a lantern or the gloves to lift up the boulder, but, you know, like you would in the normal game. But the flute, they can get to the mountain. Hippo's finding the pearls. So, yeah, this is kind of tying into what I was mentioning earlier. He's starting to unlock some Dark World access. You need the pearl in order to retain human form in the Dark World. And then you need either to defeat Aghanim to get the Titan's Mitt or to get the Power Glove with the Hammer in order to gain access to the Dark World. But, you know, if you do get access to the Dark World, it completely changes how you route. You know, Hippo might pair in later. Um, Chris is getting his first crystal. And, you know, the, the kind of trade off here is he got the boots. Who has the bigger advantage kind of idea? Absolutely. And uh, at this point, it would be hard to think that Christos wouldn't make the same checks as Hippo and Hippo wouldn't make the same checks as Christos. Um, I'm curious as to when Hippo would head to Eastern Palace now that he's picked up that Moon Pearl. Um, you mentioned before Aghanim, uh, the alter ego of Ganon, if you guys haven't played the game, um, is at the top of Hyrule Castle Tower. It's a good five minutes of time that we have to spend to kill Aghanim, and you don't get any items on the way. However, there is one item locked behind having the boots. Um, we call it the Lumberjack Cave. Um, and you have to have boots to get there. So Christos Owen may be more inclined to do this Saganim fight, knowing that he already has his boots. Yeah, definitely. So um, with the mirror and the hook shot, because the mountains in logic, there's a lot to check up here. So Hippo, it's still again, not even going to Eastern, uh, just going to, you know, continue finding items, you know, just getting, you know, really, uh, uh, you know, wealth of assets here. The mirror can let give you access to Hera, and the hookshot can also give you access to the eastern part of Death Mountain. One thing so that, that we're sort of lacking, though, is a sword. Yeah, it's still no weapon uh, in terms of a sword. The sword is, you know, very handy, but, you know, bow, you know, fire rod, hookshot, I think they'll be okay for now. Well, it's time for our first look at the Dark World. You're not going to see uh, Hippo's Dark World bunny sprite. However, we get a map check. Um, we have three pendants here in the Dark World. Turtle Rock, um, Palace of Darkness, and Swamp Palace. The rest are crystals. Yeah, so like we mentioned, you do need all seven crystals in order to open up Ganon Tower to go to feed Ganon. But because items can be anywhere, what you're looking for might be in a pendant dungeon. So even though, you know, Swamp Palace is a pendant, and you might never have to go in there. You may, in fact, have to go in there. <laughs> yep, um, I would never be surprised at all to see something, you know, very unfun happening at Turtle Rock, you know, like at Trinex. Um, we've, we've already picked up the bow and the vanilla flippers, though, and I say vanilla as a joke. Um, you would find the flippers where Christos is going right now, uh, the King Zora. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, the, the boots here are uh, going to good work for Christos. Uh, water movement can be slower. <laughs> boots make it quicker. But uh, yeah, not he's kind of doing what Hippos is doing, and Hippos is going through uh, Death Mountain here. He's in a cave that we love to call Paradox Cave, and the reason we say that is because if you look carefully on Death Mountain, you'll see the entrances are relatively um, above or below each other, but you fall down a hole to go higher up in the mountain. Uh, very strange thing. There are seven items here, though, so Hippos checking through here, and it doesn't look like we found anything too significant. No, not so far. He still does have Hera, but obviously going for the more end dense locations here. Uh, Hippo Ooh, doing a bomb jump. jump here, which is a nice technique. You can actually, uh, if you set up your Y coordinate first, and then set up your X coordinate, the game will create a bit of a barrier for you, so you will not actually fall, and you can do that bomb, uh, that bomb placement very quickly. Uh, it's one of the few bomb jumps where you really should have no fear of falling. And it looks like uh, Christos Owen wants to be ready to do more bomb jumps himself. He's going to pick up 10 bombs. Instead of uh, doing it in Kakariko, he does it here alongside Lake Hylia. Um, also gets a chance to see that Aether Medallion if he hasn't already. 
Yeah, definitely. Uh, it, it brings up something I meant to mention earlier. Um, Hippo currently going through, uh, <laughs> with Boots, like to call it, um, well, it's it's just like a, a dashing cave, but without Boots, like to call it like, Pump Cave um, in terms of the technique. Kind of looks like a simon roll. Uh, not the funnest to walk through just because it's you know, somewhat long and winding, but rupee management, item management, very important. Um, you know, they need rupees in order to buy an item from Sora to open up House of Darkness. Uh, so, you know, Chris is using some of his rupees to buy bombs, um, which means he'll have fewer for later. But yeah, uh, Bombos Medallion in Spiral Cave. So we haven't talked much about uh, medallions. We did mention we saw the ether earlier on uh, Lake Hylia Island. We will need to have access to the Dark World and Mirror to get to that item. Uh, but these medallions, despite being regular spells that we can use in the game, and they're kind of slow, so we don't use it too often, but we do also have the opportunity to open two different dungeons with these uh, medallions, which medallions are required for these dungeons is also randomized. You'll see them on the trackers at the bottom of the screen here, which um, shout outs to our tracker, I think it was um, Oski today, correct? Oh yeah, that's definitely correct. Uh, make sure to follow Oski if you uh, like what you see, I appreciate the tracking job. Uh, a lot of people working very hard here. As you'll see though in the uh, tracker at the bottom, um, in the bottom right corner, there are two circles there. When we find out what those medallion requirements are to access Misery Mire and Turtle Rock respectively, uh, we'll be filling those in. And those may or may not be required depending on uh, if we need to get into, say, Turtle Rock for the uh, for the Pendant. And, and that is a possibility as well. If you've played A Link to the Past or even Ocarina of Time, you know that the Master Sword, the Sword of Evil's Bane, tends to be uh, locked behind a few Pendants. And there is just one item in the world that's locked behind all three. Um, even the Pendant uh, the pedestal is included as one of the item locations. Yeah, definitely. You see both where it's kind of trading places here. Uh, so still, you know, figuring out where we need to go. Starting to slim down some places that they can check, but, you know, still a fair bit on the table. Um, like you're kind of mentioning with the tracker, uh, you'll notice that two crystals also have an asterisk next to them. Uh, those crystals are a bit special. It allows you to open up uh, an area in the pyramid that gives you access to two items. Also, the green pennant. In the normal game, Saw Trello would give you the boots, but that item is also randomized. So even though there's pennant dungeons, um, that pennant can, that green pen can hold an extra item. So, you know, it can add a little bit more value to maybe making a gamble into one of those dungeons. I am fully convinced that Sahasrila, the guy in the um, in the hut that had those three items where uh, we found the lamp earlier, uh, just outside of Eastern Palace where Hippo is now, I'm convinced he's a cowboy for one. If you ever seen that hat, I mean, it's a hat. It's totally, he doesn't have long ears like that. Um, but he also gives us in the vanilla game, he gives us the boots, basically his cowboy spurs. It, it all lines up, it's gotta be true. Yeah, Shalashaska is one hip dude, uh, up to date with all the fashion. Um, should also be noted very quickly that you do need a sword in order to use the medallion. Um, so the sword, you know, obviously you think, well, a sword, a good weapon. But it actually does uh, open up different speed techniques, uh, particularly item dashing. We haven't seen that yet, so it hasn't been brought up. Uh, I can mention it later, but you do need the sword actually to, you know, again, use the medallion. Um, in terms of Dark World progression, without the mitt and without the hammer, uh, you know, Another option again is Aghanim, but in order to get into Aghanim's palace, you need either the cape or the master sword. And then in order to get past the curtain, you need the small sword. So again, a lot of things are still up in the air here, even though we've got a lot of items and things checked. Yeah, we've covered a lot of um, the overworld already here in the light world. Dark world obviously being something a little bit more expansive. Uh, Christos Owen trying to pick up a rock there, remembering that he does not actually have the power glove to do so. Um, but so, I mean, in terms of logic chains, and that's really the, the key highlight feature here of Randomizer, uh, we were just talking about Eastern Palace, we were just talking about Turtle Rock. Um, let's just say that our friend Boom Shakalaka in his hut happens to have, you know, the one item we need to finish this game. You would have to do all of, you know, you'd have to do all of Turtle Rock, pick up that green pendant, and bring it back to him. Now, if you didn't know where the green pendant was and didn't want to do a map check, um, you could consult um, Sahar Shalarsh for the location of it by talking to him as well. 
Yeah, it's kind of a, a fun little uh, meme in our community. Uh, his name is Difficult, so sometimes they say Szechuan, sometimes they say Sarsaparilla. Uh, as long as they know what we're talking about, um, <laughs> all things, you know, kind of weird. Christos, yeah, so in terms of where they could go, they really had Agina as a one-off near the desert area, and then of course Hera. So Christos finding his glove in Hera here. So, you know, that's a little piece of progression. Um, it could also logically open up Zora if you did not have the flippers, but of course, we've already checked Zora, so that's a non-issue. But yeah, um, Christos with the hero play here makes a lot of sense. It's a crystal. Um, doesn't really have a weapon yet to deal with Moldorm, but if he finds some hammer here, then he will not only have Dark World, but as well um, a weapon that can damage different bosses. Uh, certain weapons only affect different, certain bosses. Um, so yeah, with Moldorm, you, you would, he would need the hammer in order to do any damage. Yeah, so Hippo getting his burrito here, uh, along with the crystal. Mm, so we'll have to see where he goes next. Again, you know, he did go to the mountain, he skipped Hera, but he knows that there are not many places left, probably thinking Hera. Maybe he wanted to wait uh, until he had a proper weapon to deal with Moldorm. So it made a lot of sense for him to originally leave. And uh, yeah, he's, he's trying to figure out where he wants to go exactly. Sometimes you have to pick. You know, between two very difficult locations, uh, neither option might seem appealing. Yeah, so it looks like he's going to go uh, check the bonk rocks here with the boots. It does open up uh, these bonk locations that Hippos is at, and also sometimes people like to route in that lumberjack check that Yuda mentioned um, prior. And so, because you need the boots in order to get that item to begin with you know, why check it earlier when you can check it later. It's more preference, some like the information, some like the extra tree pulls and the like. You see here, Hippo, uh, just strip for going it. Uh, with the mirror, it makes sense. You can check it later in the dark world. So, uh, sick kid <laughs> having our hammer. You might remember in the original game, he gave you the bug net. Um, this time he has the hammer. Hammer, incredible item. It does the same damage as a tempered sword and it opens up a lot of the world and hippo is a glove away from dark world access and christos uh, be lining it straight there gonna get his hammer has dark world access with the glove and hammer the two locations that you can check uh uh, rather, sorry, two locations, areas that you can enter the Dark World from are Kakariko here, where Christos is going to show, and then South and Link's House. So how you route in terms of the Dark World, you know, matters to, you know, depending on your items, what options you have, and where you're hoping you'll eventually end up. Yeah, because of his, you know, items, um, flippers, he could do a clockwise tour around the Dark World. People kind of like to hit a lot of locations on the way to other things. So Chris is here, could do skull woods, you know, kind of loop that in a clockwise manner over to maybe the catfish area, you know, down to pod. That sort of thing could do counterclockwise where you, you know, go into the village of outcasts and then work your way south. Not a lot of options, but I anticipate that he'll probably do a counterclockwise tour here. And yeah, Hippo, Hippo, <laughs> Hippo, <laughs> Hippo getting his gloves, so he now has Dark World, but it looks like he's going to ought to continue in the tower. Never know what you'll find here, and with the hammer you actually can finish it. So this is a boon that Hippo has over Christos. He can use the hammer to take out Moldorm, get his crystal. He will not have to double dip a lot of these areas, so he'll be able to full clear Hera. Hera having two items, uh, of course the one being the glove, but we'll get his other crystal. Christos will have to come back for it later, and I think he found the king of Samaria. Well, Phantom Ryu out there um, would have a lot of words to say about that having to be Kane. Uh, no Undertaker references here. Oh, most definitely. 
Yeah, Krista Cynthia's town. Uh, he does have a hammer, which means he can access the entire dungeon. You don't actually need uh, anything besides a weapon in order to hit blind uh, to finish the dungeon. Samaria cane works, hammer works, uh, different weapons because of the, their startup, their active frames, and uh, you know, in terms of timing, uh, can make it easier to do the fight. But only the ham the hammer only you know locks one chest and it might not lock an item so very common dungeon for a lot of people to do four items but it's not terribly long not terribly front loaded the design of it allows you to enter and then re-enter you know as you like so again makes a lot of sense crystal can full clear but blind might be a little bit tricky although you know again samaria block makes it much simpler so very convenient find and we got to see some really cool things with the hook shot uh, while hippo was in the basement waiting on the tile room um, whenever you have the hookshot active while it's in its animation, um, extending or retracting, or if you're moving towards an object from the hookshot, uh, you're invincible. You have iframes. So we can take advantage of that in a lot of different places. Uh, Hippo was being a little stylish, grabbing onto the peg blocks just to be, well, I guess just stylish. I mean, it looked awesome. I, I don't see people do that too often. Yeah, and uh, I mean, in terms of the seed itself, so we've been talking about a lot of mechanics and whatnot, but this is actually a really interesting seed. Um, oftentimes when you watch racers, because the world is so open to them, they can take entirely different routes and it can be difficult to go, well, who's ahead, who's behind? You know, a, a player might seem to have an advantage, like Christos finding the boots earlier, you suddenly think, oh, Christos, you know, surely ahead because he can move quicker. But then, you know, Hippo having the hammer is able to full clear Hera here, won't have to double dip. So that's, you know, a credit to his gameplay. Um, so in terms of who's ahead, it can be hard to say. There's somewhat even now, it's really, I would say, premature to try and call that. But uh, they both are finding very, you know, good, strong progression and have a lot of options on the table. Yeah, speaking of that, um, I would guess you could probably look at the game in two or three different sections. Um, early on in the game, you know, you're trying to get access to the dark world, you know, get through the escape and all that. Mid-game, you're trying to, you know, get most of your items to achieve what we call go mode. Uh, once you have every item that you need in order to complete the whole game based on the, well, at least get to Ganon and finish him, um, based on what we have in the logics for this particular uh, seed, once you've acquired all those items, you are in what we call go mode, and then you don't have to stop for any extra item location checks. At that point, you would only do so if you wanted to improve your inventory uh, for the final climb. Yeah, definitely. So it saw Hippos defeat Mulder and did very good. Uh, again, Hammer very strong, so only three Hammer strikes to take it out. Chris just entering the blind fight here. Uh, blind takes nine hits to defeat. He has, or he, she has three phases. Uh, it needs three hits in order to knock off a head. Three hits and three hits. Damage does not matter, it is simply strikes. You need to do three strikes, three strikes, and then three strikes to finish. Um, sword, again, can make it quite simple. But Samaria block, when you place the block, it's very active. It's always incurring a hit. So, uh, you know, again, very convenient to find. The hammer would be much more tricky. But you can see Christos taking on this fight very comfortably. Yeah, it's one of the more fun items to use in that fight. Uh, you get to just do some really strange, <laughs> um, you know, placements of the blocks. And you get to see also that you can hit, you know, enemies with that block more than a few times per go. Uh, it's also very magic efficient. We can potentially find a half magic upgrade, which, contrary to the way it sounds, actually doubles your magic meter effectively. Um, or at least you use half as much magic. Um, so that may end up being pretty handy for the Fire Rod if we do find it. Uh, but both of these runners are capable of going through the rest of this race pretty much with the health count that they have and without any kind of special upgrades beyond what we need to finish the game. Yeah, and of course, uh, the hippo did just go to uh, what you might be seeing to as the hype cave. Um, it's kind of gra grandfathered in from earlier versions where there is often a lot of progression and good items. Five items there uh, today, not too much, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, just kind of a fun community thing. But he did opt to, again, not go from Kakariko. He went from Sutherland's house to Czech Hype Cave and is now kind of routing in the southern area and going straight into Swamp Palace, which I really like. Uh, Swamp Palace is a pennant, so again, it's not a crystal, but he has every item to do it and they got the items early. So again, he might be thinking, you know what, there's, there's gotta be some worth in here. Uh, so a moment ago, we were talking about go mode. This is one of those dungeons that you absolutely want to be doing in go mode uh, because you have the opportunity to skip several minutes worth of the dungeon, not having to go to the left half of the dungeon. 
um, instead diving right back to the boss. So there are a couple different ways to route it. Hippo may decide to go to the boss first anyway, um, but I think if you're coming here this early, you're trying to check everything, make sure you know, you're know you not missing any items. Yeah, uh, we, we talk about items and of course, you know, different players, you know, have different types of play method. We mentioned it earlier, if you have good execution and whatnot, you can compensate some decision. Uh, you know, some routing, you know, be it mistake or otherwise, with the execution until the point where it gets met in terms of your opponent. Same thing for routing. Routing can compensate. Uh, routing, you know, again, either can hurt, you know, can, can <laughs> either can help you until it gets matched by your opponent. A lot of these areas end up being time neutral because both people end up checking the locations anyway. So in terms of Hippo, you know, it could be, well, this is where I think the M's are and or I don't expect Christos to go here, so I'll go here. And each dungeon has, you know, it's different weighting that, you know, you can think of in more math terms where well, there's three M's here and there's two M's there. Surely I'll go to the place with three items. Uh, Swamp actually has the most items in the entire game at six within the dungeon. Uh, they went to Hera with two, they did these town with four, uh, Eastern with three, but Swamp has six. Yeah, the closest we get to that is Turtle Rock, which if you include Mimic Cave, which is technically overworld, but you know, there's differing opinions on that. Um, you know, that can also be, you know, a very dense item location, but it takes forever to get up there. You gotta climb the mountain, do it in the dark world. Uh, so this is definitely a easier location to get to. In the light world, we can just flute to Link's house and go right to the portal uh, where Christos' screen pretty much is right now. It looks as if Christos is going to join Hippo in Swamp Palace, though. Yeah, it's a little hard to say, it's seeing some indecision. Um, again, both enter the Dark World in very different ways. Uh, Christos entered from Kakariko, Hippos from the south. So the way Christos routed with hammer and lantern everything, Pod is fully in logic. Pod is also a pendant though, has five items. Um, sometimes people have different preference for where they should go. Because Christos also already checked Eastern, he cleared out those three items. So really, it's kind of at, in this seed, in this you know scenario, kind of toss up between two pennant dungeons, one having six items, one having five. So you know we saw it seemed like a little bit of hesitation from Christos. Uh, he kind of set up to where he could nicely go into pod, but it's designed to also go into swamp. This is really interesting, though. Um, I mean, if you're here and you don't get every single item, you know, you're going to go all the way to the boss and. I just can't imagine wanting to fight this boss with no sword. I mean, you can absolutely do it with the hammer. It's just you have to hit the menu about, I don't know, 30 times? Yeah, I would say uh, in tandem with the left side, this is probably, you know, again, more the bolder play. But in terms of like items and progression, you think, well, you need the bow, you need the hammer, you need the lantern in order to do House of Darkness. Um, but for Swamp, you need, you know, the hammer, but you also need, you know, uh, the mirror, the flippers, you know, hookshot, like, might, it might just be a play based on the fact that there are more items required, so maybe it's a stronger indication that Swamp is actually where the progression is. Well, if they do make the decision to finish off Argus, the boss of this dungeon, uh, the Pirate King in my opinion, he is one eyeball, uh, surrounded by several puffs, if he makes that decision, then he does have the pendant in case it is an item on the pedestal that we need. Uh, that's a very low percent chance, I think 5%, but, you know, maybe playing for insurance here, making sure that we're not missing anything. Um, this is game one of the best of three, though, so he has a game to give. Uh, both of these runners do. So, you know, maybe it makes sense to be making a bit more of a risky play here. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, sometimes just, you know, information, trying out a play, uh, different play styles, different methodologies, you know, they can really factor into, you know, how things go. And with the seed changing, you know, it's like, do you retain your gameplay? You know, do you go for extra gambles, truly hope to like snake out a win, or you know, do you do it to try and uh, again like a little bit more toss it away? Um, obviously, you don't want to toss it away, but you guys know what I mean. Um, but yeah, currently in terms of items with Samaria and everything, like we're really looking for uh, the Titan's Mitt. Titan's Mitt will open up a ton. It'll open up, you know, the dark. Um, <laughs> uh, the <laughs> sorry, we just got sword. Very hype. Um, might still see many boss, but yeah, that's that's very good. Um, in tandem with the medallion, we'll open up more, but again, still looking for the mitts. If we had the mitts, we could go into the mire area, um, open it up, you know, potentially with our medallions. If we had the mitts, we could go into Dark World Death Mountain, you know. If we had the mitts, we could go into Ice Palace. They're really looking for the mitts right now, but the sword is a lovely find, and they need that as well. 
If you're familiar with um, Ocarina of Time, you may have referred to them as the Golden Gauntlets, but they're the Titans mates here in A Link to the Past in this version of Hyrule. This sword is interesting for this boss fight. Now we have sword spins available to us. We may see a faster boss kill because of it without menuing, but Hippo will actually do uh, menu Argus, so you're going to see him open and close this menu many times. I think Christos Owen is going to do sword spins with double hook shots, though. I'm, I Maybe he'll prove me wrong, though. Yeah, we'll have to see. Um, again, because it's pen dungeon, the the races could leave the you know the dungeon early. But if you're missing an item, you might be worried that you're leaving an item in the dungeon, and then to get back here, you know, it takes a lot of time. It can it can be very risky. Also, just kind of a side note, I think Titan Smith, you know, it's kind of a cooler name. Um, gold, very malleable, you know, naturally, you know, softer type metal. But you know, Titan, like, you know, it's got that oomph. It almost kind of brings back like a Greek, you know, history or something, you know, it reminds me of Clash of the Titans for whatever reason, but we, we do become quite legendary with that kind of lifting capability. Uh, I don't know if you guys noticed, but those rocks look pretty big, pretty heavy. They're four times the size of Link. Well, we're seeing the difference here when you don't have the menu in this boss. Christos Owen was probably half the dungeon behind in terms of how far they were at the same time, and these sword spins really saving time for him here. Yeah, I'm not sure if Chris has actually went to the left side. Uh, admittedly, that is something I'm not remembering at the moment, you know, having so much to track here. But uh, unfortunately, just some blueberries, some bombs on the Argus, and uh, a hippo reward with one extra pseudo bomb in the blue pendant. Well, there was some blue theming, so blue pendant is going to be our reward here. Definitely doesn't give us anything uh, right away, but who knows? That pedestal dream, if you uh, have been waiting for a hundred matches, this is the one, this is the one of 20 of those matches that'll actually, I'm sorry, one of five of those matches that might be a pedestal seat. We're hoping for it. It makes for a longer race. So if you want to see more Link to the Past randomizer, it's always fun to see it from the commentary couch. Absolutely horrible to see it as a runner. Uh, I would say it kind of depends on the seat and the layout, potentially. Uh, most people certainly don't like it. Um, there, there are some niche times where I personally do like a pedestal seed, but again, it, it really depends on the seed. Uh, you know, every every race, every game can be, you know, quite, quite different. But, uh, yeah, so Chris's did skip the last side, but it is now going back in. So again, they were synced for a little bit, and it seemed like you did save some time in terms of the boss fight, but going back in, so you'll, you'll see them kind of, you know, even out a little bit more further here. Exactly. And uh, we saw Hippo there go south of the Haunted Grove, and I'm a little bit spurned here. He skipped the best meringue, uh, the blue meringue, which in my opinion is the better of the two boomerangs. We already have the red boomerang from earlier in the race. It goes farther, but has a lot of lag frames, so if you're a purist about those saving those frames, you don't want that one. Yeah, both of them kind of have some interesting strategies, but in general, the more spritz are on the screen, uh, the more lag it gets added. Uh, Lag reduction is actually really important. Um, you might not notice it too much, but if you see like a player exit a stairwell um, from a different floor holding left or right, it's so that they're canceling a little bit of lag. Um, there's other things too, like in Skull Woods, uh, there's a screen where a wall master will fall down with two uh, Gibdos. Uh, if you have a spray on the screen, the wall master will actually not spawn in. Pardon me. <laughs> Um, that's adorable. Uh, you also may have noticed on screen just a moment ago, Hippo, when he was doing the race game, drew a shape in the ground for us using that shovel. He drew an M, um, an homage to his sprite, which is actually a Mario sprite. If you haven't played a randomizer uh, seed here in A Link to the Past, you can select from nearly 100, maybe even more at this point, uh, sprites that you can play as instead of just regular Link. We obviously see Roy Koopa on Christos Owen's screen and Mario here on the left. Um, plenty of diversity in that regard. So if you have any love for that or the, the puppy on Giselle Schaff's um, side, again, I gotta say it, I love puppies, adorable. Uh, if you have any love for sprites, there's plenty that you can play as. Yeah, most certainly. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, I assure you she's completely fine. She is a love suck. She just wants attention. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I'm trying to, trying to placate her a little bit. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, re real quick. Um, so yeah, you do need three pendants in order to, you know, pull the pestle item. But if you have a book, you can actually read what's on the pestle. Hippos does not currently have the book, but should it, you know, be in Skull Woods, you know, it would be a great time to write it in with the mirror. Um, should that work out, you can also use the book to read the tablets. And you do need uh, the Master Sword in order to grab uh, the items from the tablets, the one on Death Mountain and the one south of Link's house uh, near the desert. 
And if I heard your dog friend correctly, our third surprise guest commentator, I believe Hippo went into Skull Woods, which only has two items. Uh, so that's a pretty quick check to make. Uh, Christos Owen seemingly heading in the same direction. Uh, you mentioned the book. Since we don't have it, we know he's not heading to check the pedestal right now. Um, the nice thing, too, is we have everything we need to do this. Previously, we needed to have a sword in order to slash the curtains heading towards uh, Mothula, the boss of this dungeon, and the Hippo here having no problems with our Gibdo mummy friends, um, walking into one of the only rooms that has completely random enemy spawns. They all spawn in random positions, so interesting to find that. And we get a fetch quest in the shovel. Uh, yeah, the shovel only unlocks one item, so, you know, fetch quest, you get an item to potentially unlock an item. Uh, there are two of those um, in the game, the mushroom and the shovel. There are some items that only open up like a location or two, but then they might have, you know, m more multifaceted use to them. Uh, just so quick, the dog's name is Luna. So if the people want to add her name, uh, go for it. I don't expect it. And it's a lot of work, so don't probably. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, just kind of kind of wrap that up. But uh, um, of course, um, yeah, uh, you need the sword. The sword will only open the curtains. Uh, or the vines in this case in Skullwoods. A lot of items have, you know, different uses to them. You know, they're fairly malleable in that you can use, you know, again, the fire rod to light torches as well as the lamp. But then the fire rod can damage things, whereas the lantern, you know, can uh, illuminate dark rooms. These vines that Hippo is about to cut, you need a sword. So even though they had the fire rod, which opens up the back of Skullwoods here, they in fact did need the sword in order to get to Mothula here. And Skullwoods having two items and, you know, being a red crystal, this is a lot of progression right here. Yeah, so that Pyramid Fairy may end up being um, related to this, or at least we may end up um, thinking about that in regards to why we're here. Um, also, this boss fight is something worth talking about. Uh, this game is totally coded perfectly, I, I, I say in jest, uh, because Mothula here cannot take damage if you knock him into these spikes. So that's something that you have to contend with in this fight, and I'm very impressed to see Hippo going after this with the fighter sword. Um, possibly just doing sword buffers here to try and avoid some of these spikes. You can kind of strafe a little bit, um, but running low on health, absolutely. Yeah, this is potion. really scary. He does have a potion. Yeah, this, this is really good. He doesn't have the fairy from earlier, but has the blue and has red potion. So using the blue potion to get access to the fire rod, Mothula takes 16 uh, fighter sword slashes. That's the white sword. Um, eight master sword or eight charge spins with the fighter. Um, or I might be mistaken that. I don't know. I'm kind of. There's a lot going on. <laughs> there's some damage <laughs> math. Yeah, there's like the, the spikes are like class four and they're immune to that and the temp, you know, butter doesn't work, blah, blah, blah. Mothio takes a lot of hits. Very scary. How's the potion? Dig good. Good hippo. Good That's probably good the best hippo. way to describe it. Um, but so it's a scary fight for a lot of runners, um, particularly people newer to the game. Um, if you're looking for a way to get into this, though, and you want to learn more about a Link to the Past randomizer, how to play Link to the Past itself, uh, there are multiple discords that you can join. Uh, I recommend joining the randomizer discord. And uh, Hippo, that was <laughs> Titan's Mint as the last possible item in Skull Woods. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that is really big. You know, again, two items in Skull Woods, feed the boss, no item, won't, won't have to go back in, find some titans in it. This, with the flute, opens up Mire area, which also opens up desert. In the vanilla game, you need the book to get into desert. Uh, in here, you can use the mirror to warp, and Hippo is going straight into desert, no questions asked. Um, makes a lot of sense, can check, you know, if, you know, what to have medallion. Mire is here. Titans in it also opens up Ice Palace and Dark Death Mountain. And Bombos is our required item. I was just about to ask. I'm glad you have better eyes than I do. Yeah, it's, uh, I saw the case of Dio Platter, and uh, I knew for certain. Yeah, I was going to go with Spin Cycle myself, but I like yours better. Well, here's uh, that mirror coming to great use. So normally you would have to have the Book of Medora to move these statues in front of the dungeon entrance. We haven't even been over this way, because even though we have the flute, there's nothing we can do here, really. Uh, there is one item location in the desert, um, not the dungeon itself, but in the area that you can check in Agina's Cave. But that's a slow time, you know, investment to, you know, really be spending on that. So we might do that leaving this dungeon. And with the boots, we have no worries about an item or a key being on that torch. Uh, it happens to be a compass today. Yeah, definitely. Uh, if there was a big key on there, 
um, and there is no key anywhere else. The dungeon would be boot locked, but uh, of course, you know, fire source, glove, and the boots. There is no fear of not being able to complete desert here. But uh, I'm taking a look here, and I'm not sure if Hippo actually did get Samaria. If he doesn't have Samaria, that means he actually cannot finish Mire. So if he did have it, obviously, you know, and of course Chris is here too, would be able to fully do those dungeons. But without Samaria, uh, you know, just he can complete it um, without it. We do get to see a really great um, use of the mirror here uh, from Hippo. And you're going to see Christos Owen do the same thing after he picks up his big key in its vanilla location on the right side. Uh, the mirror, as we talked about early in the race, will take you back to the last entrance you enter the dungeon from. So if some dungeons have multiple entrances, this one's included. Uh, we might see that in Turtle Rock. But we find the Sword of Evil's Bane here in the big key chest, or the big chest itself in uh, Desert Palace, which is a very nice damage upgrade. Yeah, absolutely. You actually, as a minimum, do need the Master Sword in order to finish the game. Uh, Ganon will not take damage without the Master Sword. Uh, you can have Temper and Silvers and other things, but uh, at a minimum, you do need the Master Sword. So uh, that is, in terms of sword you know, progression, the final piece of the puzzle there. Any other upgrade will, will more so be for you know saving time or you know use the boss fights, that kind of thing. But... Uh, yeah, no, Hippo not having the cane, so cannot finish Myra. We'll have to see whether he goes in with the flute and everything. It was a quick check to come here anyway. Desert makes a lot of sense, but oh, I'll have to see if that really, you know, factors into how things play out here, whether Chris will still, you know, choose to go straight into Myra. So, uh, Giselle Shaft, I'm uh, crossing my T's, dotting my I's, carrying over the ones. Uh, as far as I can tell, this is go mode, isn't it? Yeah, it's looking that way. Uh, <laughs> very quick, interesting, you know, pen layout, and then yeah, the two swords. Yeah, so yeah. Christos Owen has the uh, cane. Um, we have to double check with uh, Hippo if he managed to pick it up, but that would be enough for Christos Owen to know that he doesn't have to check any other item locations, unless he wants some comfort items, and with most of the bottles out of the way, there's really no reason to. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, it's a very fast seed. Um, Again, just because of how everything was laid out, and then the options they took. And yeah, Christos in very, very good position here. Alright, so um, thankfully, uh, chat's putting us back in a uh, position to understand exactly what we missed here. Um, because I did miss uh, that Kana Samaria was in Thieves Town. So right now, Hippo needs to go to Thieves Town if he wants to hit go mode. Um, that is the only remaining item that Kana Samaria for him to enter this as well. Ooh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. He did forgo it. It was in one of the first four, um, and of course there's crystal. So, you know, Hippo will be going there, but unfortunately, you know, doing these extra checks here, you know, using the mirror to check his location, a tunnel will add up until he finds the items he needs. So for his sake, he really does need to go to Thieves Town sooner. You know, Chris is being rewarded for, you know, just going to Thieves Town and getting that out of the way earlier. Well, so there's a joke in the community about red mail being for cowards. Uh, red mail being the best armor you can pick up, but for as little time as it takes for Hippo to pick it up there, uh, no reason not to. Plus, we get to see the really nice fire Mario sprite. I think that may have influenced his decision slightly. Yeah, it's kind of interesting, uh, you know, the red mail for cowards, but we are playing on the normal mode difficulty. So I wonder, uh, you know, how that works out and, you know, have a lot of different modes in terms of randomizer. This is the normal mode, so you know, nothing too, too crazy got all your items, but there are harder difficulties where you do get less hearts and you don't even find the red mail to begin with. Yep, that's absolutely true. Um, something that, you know, a lot of people who have watched this tournament might not have realized there are tons of ways to play a randomizer. Uh, you can even play a fun mode called Triforce Hunt where you pick up little pieces of the Triforce similar to Zelda 1, uh, but lots of different things to uh, do when you're playing randomizer. This is just the standard mode uh, that is most commonly used for uh, tournament play. Uh, that being said, though, red mail is not literally for cowards, folk. It's, it's a good, you know, defensive item. You don't have 20 hearts in this situation. Um, doesn't take long to pick up. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not something that I've been, you know, terribly familiar with myself, but red mail is very good. Um, it, you know, you're effectively like doubling your health on screen there in terms of hearts. Uh, actually, in, uh, in mechanics, the, the magic and the health, you know, um, icons here, they're more for aesthetic. There actually is a number-based system to the magic and to the health. So, for example, you know, if you have, 
um, the cane of uh, Berna, when you activate it, it'll take 16 magic and then like one magic per second or per tick. Uh, you know, that that goes into it and there's a great, you know, wealth of mechanics and stuff behind the game. But, you know, the visual indication of the magic, you know, suffices for most people. Well, as we're going through um, Misery Mire here, which only has two oh. item locations as well, um, was that a... Did he just dash through the whole hallway? Yeah. Um, uh, using God. your boots, you go at... Yeah, you go at four pixels of frame. There are two spike traps on the side, so Hippos was in a very perfect X-coordinate position, dashing from the door and reacting uh, in order to just dash th straight through the hallway there. Um, the RNG is also favorable, the gibbos, the enemies were not in the way. So, you know, that, that was very well done. And it's kind of like, little stuff like that is, is definitely fun to see from the players. One really nice thing for Christos here though, finding the Tempered Sword in Misery Mire. Uh, this is a really nice upgrade. It's by far the best damage upgrade you get from a sword upgrade. And also it makes it so that we don't have to do a million sword spins to finish off a uh, final Ganon fight. So that's an amazing find for Christos and very, um, good timing to get it because you're in misery mire you can actually do a really fun boss kill strategy using damage boosting and interestingly enough right around the uh, no major glitches speed run health count that you would have in this dungeon too so this feels like familiar territory but unfortunately for christos uh, he's gonna have to use potion to have magic here uh yeah this is where you do need the samaria block uh cane in order to you know hit the block you can do everything you don't have to worry about the dark rooms if you're proficient but you do in fact need the cane in order to depress that one little switch yeah that's the only time you need it in this dungeon we may use it again here on this screen and there's actually some really complicated speed tech you can do uh but christos owen not trying to do anything spooky here in the basement uh probably better for us because that's hard to explain yeah, he did do a item dash though. So again, when you have the boots, you know, a sword and different items, you can pair them together. And so, you know, Japanese one, you know, 1.0 version type thing in terms of the original game. Uh, Chris is hitting dash and Y at the same time, was able to punt that block and then activate it later. So a lot of fun tech to go along with that. The developers worked very hard at patching the game and making it very perfect. Game's masterpiece. And then we play the older version of it where we exploit a lot of things as you can. Yep, one of the very nice things about uh, 1.0, but we're seeing those damage boost strats against Vitreus here. This is one of the more difficult boss kill strategies. And does he pull off the zero cycle? Almost. No, a little bit slower, yeah. Um, because, you know, the, the viscous uh, liquid here um, will only do one, one hard damage to you. And the eyeballs will do much more. So, you know, tanking damage from one source to gain invincibility you know, invincibility frames in order to attack a different source. Uh, you know, very good strategy, very common in the speedrun. But, uh, you know, as long as you defeat the fight in a relatively quick manner, in this case, you know, that is acceptable. And it's very uh, hype to see damage boost or WQ strats, as some folks may call it, um, against Vitreus. We oftentimes don't get to see this dungeon in Randomizer uh, because there's so few locations in here that can actually have an item. Um, Hippo here, I thought for a second he was trying to preserve the bird for a bird toss, but unfortunately this is no ether medallion. We're not going to be able to toss this bird into the water, but we will get to burn him. Um, also, I want to say thanks to all of you tuning in from the front page of Twitch. Um, we are honored to have the opportunity to compensate this match for you. Uh, the semifinals, first of the best of three series between Hippo and Christo Owen. Uh, if you've been enjoying what you've been watching today, highly recommend you give these runners a follow. Uh, they are really well known in the community, also very good at the game. And if you want to catch more randomizer action, uh, you're always going to find it here on the home of uh, A Link to the Past Randomizer Tournament this year, Speed Gaming, um, as well as the other Speed Gaming channels 2 through 6, and of course, Link to the Past Randomizer 2 through 4 as well. Yeah, uh, should, should be noted real quickly that, so we did not see Ice Pass earlier. The reason for that is, while we could have faked Flippered, even though we got Flippers as the very first item, to the island where the dungeon is, we did need the Titan's Mitt to lift up the block. From there, you also either need the Bombos Medallion and a sword, or the Fire Rod to take out those freezer enemies. So in terms of getting that far, you need that many items, you know, in order to get into the dungeon. And then also further into the dungeon, you need the hammer. So we're seeing this now, and fortunately for Christus in go mode, because you get to skip large portions of the dungeon. But uh, yeah, could not enter here earlier uh, for those reasons. We get to see some amazing speed tech here in the Ice Palace um, 
for one, you're going to see a really awesome bomb jump. This is by far the most important bomb jump of the game. You skip more than half the dungeon doing this. We do this in the randomizer because we can route the dungeon a little more conveniently if we have the, the peg switches in that particular configuration. Normally, if you were doing this game vanilla, you would have to go all the way around the dungeon in a big old loop. Uh, the pen gators here are going to be no match for our tempered sword. Christos Owen making his way through pretty quick here. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, there's a lot, again, a lot of little tricks. That bomb jump is actually pretty peculiar. If you hold a left direction coming out of the doorway, you'll actually be one pixel away from the wall. And then if you fall and you're still holding it, you'll be flush. So there's like, you know, some variance to that. And then there's actually two different positions you can end up on your trajectory. Uh, Chris has got a good position where if you pair it with a hammer, you can actually do an item dash downwards with the hammer that will allow you to go straight through the pots. But uh, yeah, so just some neat little tech there. And there are so many things about um, A Link to the Past to learn. I'll tell you this, I've been playing this since I was four years old. Um, I was born actually the year this was released in um, you know the US, feeling a little old and young at the same time about that. But ever since I started playing this game, I've never had a day that I've watched it that I haven't learned something. And you can too, I promise there are a million things to learn here. And Christos Owen um, showing us just how easy he can make Cold Stare look despite this being one of the more threatening bosses in the game. Yeah, it takes eight fire rod shots or uh, when you use the bombos to take out that shell. And then Cold Stare, you know, has quite a lot of damage. Um, you know, fairly simple boss, but actually really scary when the game expects you have blue mail here and, uh, you know, you may or may not. Our runners, you know, do happen to have blue and or red mail, but uh, yeah, it did very well at that fight. I was kind of mentioned earlier that Tempered Sword, you know, is a very good sword. That's actually the best sword that you really hope for. Um, in terms of the Ganon fight, it can make things much quicker. Uh, things like the Butter Sword, while strong, uh, they more so mitigate human error and can even add some leg frames. So again, in terms of items, Chris is so in, you know, having the Tempered Sword, very ideal. The only item he's, you know, really missing in order to, you know, help with the Ganon fight in terms of speed would be the Silver Arrows. And uh, so, you know, <laughs> going along here, you might run into them. But for now, I'm going to finish up Hera, where he could not finish before, in a very good position. Uh, currently ahead of uh, Hippos in terms of, you know, who's ahead, who's behind. Yeah, so to give you kind of an update, folks, um, if you have not been watching this whole race or if you just tuned in, uh, right now you see Hippo doing one of the more fun bosses. He's having some trouble because of the position of these eyeballs. But Crystal Owen is coming up on the seventh crystal. Uh, dungeon that he's going to clear in order to get to Ganon's Tower. Um, because of where the portal is here on Death Mountain, it's a very convenient way to get to Ganon's Tower very quickly. Uh, but once you have all seven crystals, you can go to Ganon's Tower itself. Uh, he finds the Quake Medallion as well here on uh, Death Mountain. And then you, once you climb it, you do some refights of the Light World bosses from the original game, eventually culminating in a fight on the pyramid with Ganon himself. Uh, that will be enough to win the, the race here and tie up or finish up the first game of the series of course we do still have two more races uh between these runners as well or potentially up to two um if we end up going one one after the next race yeah so of course chris is being go mode uh skipping a lot of locations just you know powering through to the end And that's one of the nice things about finding that go mode immediately. While we didn't get to save too much time in the dungeons, uh, Christos Owen was able to go right down to the basement of Ice Palace. He could have been still in there, actually, if uh, he yeah. had the whole thing. Yeah, I was going to say real quick. Uh, yeah, so you guys saw that, you know, Hippos is at the Vitreous Fate, you know, trying to take the damage. Uh, the eyeballs can be RNG, so it can be really tricky to do that strategy, but very heads up of him to go for that strategy. Yeah, there are several different ways to kind of take it safer, and it's nice to see that runners have the knowledge to, you know, kind of change on the fly what they're going to do in these situations. And you kind of have to, if you're going to be competitive in this tournament of over 500 people, you got to be willing to do something that other people uh, don't know to do or don't practice. Yeah, like just a lot of little things, you know, strategies, executions, um, trying to cut corners with routing, because again, both players overall will go to a lot of the same locations, but how they got to that location, what they pair that location with, is where the divergence comes in. A lot of things end up being time neutral. If you're both going to Kakariko doing those checks, you know, you're not really ahead or behind. It doesn't mean too much. But if you're skipping a location, then, you know, it'll be a boon to your game plan. And of course, if you're against a player that maybe has stronger execution, you know, you might be more inclined to skip a location in order to compensate. 
But uh, yeah, <laughs> Chris is going getting his last crystal. So, you know, here in terms of randomizer and at speed gaming, we have a bit of a tradition where there are 22 locations the Ganon Tower Bicky can be. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time. Get your guests in chat if you have subscribed or donate bits to the channel. It can get put into a leaderboard if you get your guests right. Um, it's largely random. So, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, you know, definitely get your guests. You know, do you have a guess? It's like, oh my goodness, it's going so quick. Yeah, it seems like it's taking a second here. Uh, for my guess, I'm just gonna go 12. Um, uh, see how that goes. But yeah, in terms of Gantar here, uh, there's two overall directions that can go. It kind of forks between a left direction and a right direction. Um, both of them have different items. Uh, both of them have a little bit of characteristics to them. Like if you're going um, from the right side, it's actually quicker to go full right to get to Bob and Armos. Um, and, you know, so that might play into your thought, like, oh, I'm thinking, you know, maybe the location's deeper into when the boat, when the two paths, you know, reconnect, maybe that will be where the big key is. Um, there's different types of meta that goes into it. Some people like to check one spot, then go to the other. Some people, you know, like to check the right side and then go full left. Uh, lots of different strategies, but it looks like Chris is just going um, full right up until that point he got there. He got a key so he could continue because of the key door and grabbed one extra key, and now it looks like he's going to go full left. Yeah, and this would typically be the place where runners would diverge. Um, but, but depending on where the keys are, you may be forced into one side or the other. Um, and as you mentioned, it's faster if you're going to go right down to the Ice Armos fight, or the Bob's Room, as we like to call that glitched anti-fairy sprite, uh, to go to full right. But oftentimes, people will go to the left side because of how many items are over there. Um, we've found a bug net here, which is really not that useful to us at this point, and really not much else. I'm still looking for that big key. Yeah, so Chris, Chris has to take out these skeletons in order to open the door and continue down. Uh, Hippo has now finished Ice Pass, so he's making his way to Gun Tower. I believe that was seven items total so far. Uh, no, Chris says to go to the full right. So it was two plus the four, um, the seventh on the torch, and then four more. So 11, and now, of course, uh, the 12. All right, so my hope for uh, Bob still is alive. He would be number 14 in this scenario, I believe. Or no, no, that would be seven. Um, I get these numbers so mixed up. Uh, thankfully, we have a large community of folks, you know, keeping track of us in chat and making sure we got it right. Uh, so uh, here on the commentary side of things, you know, you could afford a little bit of variability there. Um, I didn't happen to catch because of some audio issues on my end, uh, which item location you thought it would be. Oh, I was just going to say, uh, don't feel too bad because I got bought, uh, I guess, 12. <laughs> oh, no. Well, so once oh, we no. do, um, we are going to go check the randomized room. We call it the randomized room here on Christos' side because we would never be here in a speed run. Uh, there's nothing of value in here normally, but we could find it here. Oh, and speak of the big key. Oh, hi, yeah, so there we go. And uh, just real quick, um, so if you go to the top of Tower Rock, it can be a little bit quicker to uh, get to Ganon Tower. He doesn't have it open, so, you know, just going straight in from the uh, bottom of the mountain here for Hippo. And did check a couple extra chests, maybe hoping for silver arrows. Um, as a minimum, you need the Mass Sword in order to defeat Ganon. And if you have silvers, it'll make things, <laughs> you know, much quicker. You know, speaking of but, silvers... Uh, yeah, you know? This is an awesome place to find it, though. If you're going to save some time um, here in Ganon's Tower, this is a, probably the best place to have it. You would normally need to pump two arrows into those mimics that we just saw Christos absolutely annihilate. And in fact, that's that room is the only reason that you have to get the bow in every single race. Some races allow for you to uh, get around it. So, yeah, having it for those uh, mimics is extra nice. And of course, the Ganon fight is made quite faster. You don't have to do sword spins. Uh, Christos here, though, walking through one of my favorite rooms, Ganon Ball Z. Uh, we'll see if he can take on the gauntlet very cleanly here in the next episode. Yeah, the end of the game here, uh, like in, you know, in the speedrun, you know, very execution heavy, a lot of, you know, tricks and tech. And in, in the randomizer, 
you know, with the exception of, again, you know, kind of hoping for a sword or something, it really does also tend to boil down straight into execution. So a lot of tech, a lot of stuff. This is, you know, some of the funnest parts of the game to watch, just to see how the individual people move through the room. So, you know, the gamble is you're in there. Some different RNGs, but if you know the RNGs and then, you know, have a favorable position, you can actually dash straight through all the cannonballs. You know, just a little speed text and tricks like that to get through. And this is one of the most exciting parts of um, any race is Gans Tower. And we see both runners in Gans Tower because there are things that can go wrong at the end of A Link to the Past. And let me tell you, if you've ever run this game as a speed run, you know there's things that can go wrong here, um, including not limited to. Uh, we could do a glitch that could despawn all the sprites in the tower. Uh, that could totally mess with our day. That's coming up in a few rooms here for Christos. Uh, you could also fall in the Ganon fight. You could die to Aghanim and any number of random things happening in between there. Um, now, dying in the tower here in the gauntlet is one of the most punishing deaths in the entire game. You would have to climb the entire tower again. Yeah, it definitely uh, re-sync these two together. Um, Chris is making good use of the silvers there, though. We saw the lamolas earlier. He used the fire rod. It takes two fire rod or ice rod shots uh, per lamola. But of course, silver arrows, you know, one silver arrow takes them out. So very good fight there. Uh, we'll see another refight here with Muldorn too, but yeah. As a frame of reference, if we, if we use like the fighter sword as one damage as like a baseline, the silver... Oh, I think you cut out briefly there. Don't worry, just pretend he got shot with a silver arrow, just like late. Fire sword is one, silver arrow, late, late, late. It does so much, like, you can't, you know, just retroactively went back in time and took out his sentence. Alright, I think <laughs> but, I uh, cut out there. Um, do you guys get through what I was saying about silvers? Uh, you, you, you cut out uh, right at the, what you're about to say. Alright, so <laughs> fire sword is one you damage. You lost the juicy part, man. Silvers are 100 damage. It, it's overpowered. It's an amazing item. Um, and we're only going to get to see it for a little bit. Yeah, definitely. But uh, Moldurm to refight. Um, you know, normally it's like, oh, you had the fire sword to do the first one. But uh, Moldurm to got tempered sword. You know, it's it's the fight is actually <laughs> much easier for Moldurm too. It's kind of strange compared to all the others. But uh, one tempered slash and one charge spin will be enough to take out Moldurm. Uh, you'll see runners try to not get in the Moldurm in rage phase when they fight him, and it's crystalistically like good. And he's not in the Aga two fight, so we did not see Agnum one. Uh, where you have to reflect these orbs, but Agnum on his very first shot will always shoot out, you know, a yellow or red orb that you can reflect. And you'll have two doppelgangers that also always shoot out orbs. But then on the next cycle, um, Aga has 50 50 to shoot out uh, what we colloquially refer to as a blue ball. You cannot reflect that, so it just, you know, wastes a shot. You need six shots to take out Aga too. Um, you can see people spamming strange numbers in chat. That's just them counting the cycle and how many hits uh, Chris has landed onto Aghanim. Yeah, nobody wants blue balls. Um, it's an unfortunate scenario to be in. Um, and of course, it's the same RNG for both of these runners for these particular bosses, Ganon's included. Um, we have four phases to this fight. Crystal's showing us really nice tempered sword strats against Ganon. You need to hit him 12 times or the effective number in uh, sword spins in order to finish each cycle. He actually got a two cycle on that first phase, but the RNG put him in a perfect position to get through this with sword spins uh, for phase two. So this is also one of the more annoying phases to deal with. Uh, so very grateful to to be able to do that and with nice RNG, I imagine. Yeah, there's four phases to Ganon, you know, like you're mentioning, uh, the first phase. If you had Master Sword, you'd actually have to do uh, 12 charge spins because, you know, for all intents and purposes, uh, you know, a sword charge spin is the slash of the next level sword. Not exactly, but you know, for you know simplicity. Uh, so 12 tempered slashes or 12 master sword spins to the first phase uh, would do the trick. So of course temper is faster. Um, with uh, you know, and the first cycle, uh, Ganon, you know, moves much quicker. Second one can be trickier, a lot longer with you know the fire snake phase. But Chris has already done phase three with the falling platforms and phase four, four silver arrow shots into Ganon takes out, you know, Chris's stone takes out Ganon. And as long as we don't fall off the platform here, uh, which has actually happened in this tournament a couple times recently, 
Um, you know, Crystal Owen will finish up his race here in the Triforce room. Um, do you happen to have the official speed racing or SRL time? Uh, yeah, his official time is one hour, 13 minutes, 18 seconds. Uh, that's a very phenomenal time in terms of, you know, the randomizer. Uh, you know, just really, you know, sub two is often a landmark for a lot of players. And of course, you know, different seeds facilitate for different finish times, just given the nature of them. But very, very fast finish time, just very minimal checking of a lot of things. You know, just hopping dungeons, you know, picking the right dungeon and just everything, you know, just playing out really well. You know, even in spite of, you know, missing an item earlier, you know, it seemed like Hippos might have had like a small advantage there, you know, depending on how things have gone. But no, just everything went really good. Yeah, so it's amazing to see anybody finish a race that quickly. Um, it's not the fastest of this tournament. I believe I've seen it in one hour and seven minutes um, at one point. By uh, I'm not sure if it was... Actually, I'm not going to say who it was because I don't remember uh, with clarity, and I don't want to be wrong on that. But uh, Hippo being not that far behind, it's looking like maybe a few minutes total uh, walking up to his Moldorm 2 fight. Uh, what we will want to do, though, in a few minutes is get Christos Owen in here for an interview. I think for how close they are together, it might be better to bring them both in together. Yeah, we'll see if we can get them both in here. Uh, you know, pretty pretty standard for these races. You know, get to hear their thoughts and them talk about it. Uh, it's pretty fun. Um, despite Chris Owen's timer still going, uh, he is in fact finished. <laughs> when you cross that bridge and get to the Triforce screen, uh, that is time. So, you know, don't be alarmed if it's still going. He did in fact finish, and Hippos is often to uh, sorry opted to forfeit. Um, which makes sense. It doesn't actually matter in terms of win-loss for him, whether he finished or not. It would just be, you know, his own kind of sportsmanship or, you know, his own personal uh, motivations for it. So absolutely no shame, uh, you know, has opted to, again, forfeit. And we'll see if I can get them both in for an interview. And of course, uh, this is just the first game of their best of three series uh, for the semifinals here in this tournament. So uh, they do still have another uh, race at the minimum, potentially two if Hippo does turn the series around um, in the next race. Uh, their next race is scheduled for Saturday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, apologies to Christos Owen from across the pond, uh, from the American uh, audience that I'm speaking from myself. And uh, they also have their game three, if necessary, scheduled for the following day on Sunday. Uh, let's see if we can get these two in here, though, for an interview. And it looks like we are joined by both of our racers here, uh, Christos Owen and Hippo. A GG, and congratulations on uh, finishing up the seat. Yeah, GG is Tebow. Hey, thank you very much, guys. Uh, good game, Hippo. Good game, man. You're welcome for not finishing the seat, by the way. <laughs> well, you may as well. It was pretty much uh, right at Moldorm 2. It was very close. Um, and, and it's an incredible race to watch. I'm sure you... Um, well, Christos, you may have may not have spoken with him in the brief interim between uh, the stream delay and showing up here. Uh, but yeah, that, it's very close for how fast the seed was. And it was an amazing show on our end to watch. I personally think it's very appropriate to stop before Moldorn too. Don't don't give him any satisfaction. Like, don't, even, don't even give him the time of the fight. Nothing. Just, just <laughs> let, let, a, let him look at you from your perch. Think about what he's done. It was, it was the googly eyes of despair. That's what he was giving me. Yeah. Well, uh, so this is obviously game one of the series, um, and Christos, you are moving up to 1-0 and in this series. Where are your head at right now, or how are you feeling in regards to this race, uh, moving into game two? Uh, honestly, I feel like I should have already been eliminated from the tournament, so I'm feeling pretty relaxed. Um, I don't really mind, like, if, if I get beaten and... I feel like it's kind of nice. I can go and play like Milana, which I really want to carry on playing. Um, but yeah, I'm already further than I expected to be um, based on my matches against Keong. So just see what happens and yeah, ride the wave until the wave falls. Speaking of which, um, to provide some context for those of you uh, joining us from the Twitch front page may not have been watching um, the rest of the tournament seeing the match between Christos Owen and Keong92. Uh, Keong92 actually fell and the Ganon fight right as he had finished Ganon, there's a small, um, I guess you'd call it a bug in the game, where you can continue moving during a cutscene. And falling off the ledge uh, gave Christos Owen a victory that led it to a game three uh, where you took the series. Uh, so that's what Christos Owen is referring to. Um, but you know, you made it all this way through this bracket. I think that you definitely deserve the place you have here. 
Um, but I wanted to ask you, Hippo, um, you know, you do have game two coming up here on Saturday. Is there anything you plan on doing to prepare for that matchup? Uh, I don't really have anything different. I'm I'm actually pretty happy with how this I played this seed. Uh, I have to go back and look at uh, how I got my uh, rear handed to me here. But, uh, you know, I, I was when, get, going up to Gans Tower feeling decent about it, um, thought, thinking I was probably pretty close. Uh, a little further behind in the end than I thought it was. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't change much. Um, just need a seed that's going to be a little friendlier to me. Yeah, no, it was, it was definitely good. Um, really, it was overall just some minor differences that kind of, you know, kind of came into play. The seed had a lot of different potential, but it just, you know, of course, again, it was a close race here, and there wasn't really anything too, too crazy. You both went to Swamp, so, you know, that wasn't really too much of a thing. Chris just did go into Thustown earlier, so had the Samaria. So when he originally went to Desert, you know, you can kind of pair that. But then you got the Hammer before... I went to Hera, so you didn't have to, you know, go up the tower. So a lot of little things. Um, he went to Eastern earlier, which uh, got him the boost a little bit earlier. So, like, yeah, you'll, you'll definitely uh, have to check out the VOD and hopefully, you know, enjoy the watch. But uh, I guess, like, you know, speaking of the seed, um, you know, any real comments on it or uh, is anything going through, you know, both your minds in regards to it? I saw it looked like Chris is going to make a, a trip to Pod and then kind of kind of has to went to swamp and uh you know so yeah like it was you. it was actually a really interesting seed um so it actually turns out like i'm like 99 percent sure that swamp was required for the swords which led to mitts which led to the other two swords that were found uh, so unless we find out what the fourth sword is or the book then the swamp play was actually completely necessary um so I was feeling pretty bad when I was in there, and the only thing I found was a sword. And then going back in and doing left side, just getting two heart pieces, I was like, eh. So that I was like, okay, I really hope the sword is the progress here. So I beelined it to Skull Woods, which found mids, and then pretty quickly after that, I found two more swords in Desert and Maya. Um, so I was like, okay, it looks like mids and then the other two swords were all sword locked, which is really rare. So I kind of enjoyed that aspect. Um, what I didn't enjoy was having to make a 50-50 decision on Pod or Swamp. Um, I wasn't actually going to go to Pod, I was going to go and get Ether from the Floating Island. But I was like, ah, I'll just get it after Swamp instead. Right, and if necessary. It's, you never know sometimes if you're going to actually have to even bother with it. Um, I think, though, I think we might have been Fire Rod locked for the the, for the Titans mids, because it, um, it was the back half of Skullwoods, right? Oh, right, yeah, you didn't need the sword. Well, I'm completely wrong. <laughs> well, you know, it was really exciting, though, to see both of you take on Mothila with Fighter Sword. Uh, you know, it really speaks to the caliber of runners we're talking to here in this interview. Um, and folks, if you haven't seen this whole tournament, I mean, they rose above 500 other people. 512, I think, is the exact number of people entering. And, you know, you got to be able to do some of these ridiculous boss fights. It's part of the reason that you see people... Um, at this you know level of finishing seeds in an hour and 15 minutes um you know as somebody who only recently just started doing nmg myself no major glitches speed run i find that incredible um and it just goes to show how much the average skill level has increased uh since the randomizer came out and of course since this tournament itself started uh so i i was very you know happy to get an opportunity to commentate and watch this race um though Interesting thing between the two of you, uh, Christos, you did find those boots rather early. I'm wondering, uh, do you think that may have been, you know, a factor here in taking game one? Uh, I mean, well, how, I don't know how late Hippo went to Ethan, um, but I, in general, I think people overestimate how much of a benefit boots are. Like, it does make a, a difference, yeah. but not a, not a large enough difference really to usually swing races unless there's like a massive divergence in time from when one person found them in the other. Yeah, they're nice to get early on and they do open up some speed tech. So in the hands of like a proper user, they can they can definitely uh, provide an edge. But yeah, it's you can you can think the same thing about different items that they'll give, you know, more of an advantage or in terms of time. I think a lot of people just kind of see boots and like boot go fast. Thing, things go fast now, you know, they kind of, you know, but uh, um, Hippo, though, um, what were your thoughts on the seed? Um, you know, we heard from Christos here, but uh, uh, did, did you have anything to say or anything kind of interesting or the like? That was a pretty nice seed, um, Jet Seed. Um, yeah, I'm fascinated by the whole sword aspect, but uh, Christos is right. I, I, now that we're kind of walking this back, the mitts were not sword locked, and uh, therefore that sword wasn't strictly necessary, I guess. 
So. Sure felt like home getting it though, right? <laughs> it wasn't what I was looking for when I went to the made that swamp play early. Um, <laughs> I thought it, it really felt like I was being told to go there, and, and then all you get, you know, it's like one of those t-shirts. I went to Swamp Palace, and all I got was this lousy sword. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty, that's pretty good too. Yeah, like again, Mitt's really early, kind of kind of locking it for you both. Um, you know, of course, Pod and Swamp are on the table. You know, six versus five items, but you know, Swamp seems longer to complete. But then, you know, flippers, mirror, you know, hookshot, hammer, you know, Swamp. Like it, it seemed to poke out a little bit more. But yeah, uh, just you know, the mitts and uh, you know, it's like oh, sword. Okay, we need that. It's nice. So you know, sword and Swamp. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, like when you actually. Like now that I've thought about it more, the like pod and swamp were both complete red herrings. All you had to do was go to Skullwoods and then go to Thieves Town, <laughs> and then that was it. Then go to Desert Mire. Like everything just fell into place if you went to Skullwoods early. Which is interesting. Go to the back half of Skull Woods without a sword just for that one chest, hoping it's not like the compass of the map. I mean, gross. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. I guess which is exactly why neither of us did that. <laughs> and there was no even kit. Don't even have book check. Pestles, yeah. And that's another characteristic of Randomizer that, you know, if, if folks, if you're, if you're out there and you haven't really seen much of this or you haven't played Randomizer much, um, you'll see people do things that are strictly not required, but, you know, you're going to go based on where you can find the most items um, in many situations. So we talked earlier also about how go mode affects how you go through these dungeons. Uh, Swamp Palace having been quite a time sink in the grand scheme of things, we may have seen the fastest seat of the tournament if we didn't even bother going there. Yeah, I think it definitely this like the layout of the items definitely had potential to get. I don't think I've ever done a uh, go mode thieves town in the first four. That was fun. <laughs> I just can't believe you did. Like it baffles me with a uh, crystal thieves town to not go there early. Like I just I can't fathom that. Well, he did go to some different locations first, so. I don't know, because you went, you went in straight from Kakariko, so it's like the counterclockwise tour, you know, made more sense, you know, kind of leading to where you were. Um, he actually went from High Cave and then went into Swamp and then kind of worked his way back up. Um, this is pretty interesting, but... Well, I think that pretty much covers most of um, the questions that I could think of. Um, Giselle Schaff, did you have any other things you wanted to ask these runners? Uh, not really in particular. Um, yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah. All right, well, on that note, uh, just to give you uh, guys out there, guys and gals, you know, watching here on Twitch, and thank you for joining us if you're joining us from the front page. Um, first thing, always, you got to follow these runners. These folks are amazing players of the game and also uh, have a lot of knowledge if you're looking for, you know, opportunities to learn more about the game. I'm sure their streams are great sources of that. And of course, they do have their next match in the series. As for this uh, channel, Speed Gaming, for the rest of the day, we do have a couple other things going on. Um, at 6.30, about an hour from now, we will have a Super Metroid race um, in their tournament, as well as at 8 p.m., A Link to the Past randomizer overworld glitches. If you want to see all the broken ways that this game can be played, uh, and Christos probably has a good hand in programming some of that. Or, um, Christos, uh, you know, you do a lot of the logic stuff in the back end, right? Uh, yeah, so me and uh, Josh, he used to go by the his name X Released. Me and him pretty much wrote the entire like overworld glitches and glitch logic. Um, and then since the game just gets broken and broken and broken um, more and more, like we've had to update things. But it's gone through some iterations. It's a really, really fun mode. Um, I'm actually in that tournament as well. Uh, you start with boots, so you can do all these wild clips, which is awesome. Um, but nobody should watch me because I'm terrible at clipping <laughs> and glitches uh, these days. So I'm expecting to get eliminated in round one of that tournament. Well, it'll be fun to watch either way. And the uh, race that we have at 8 p.m., uh, that's going to be between VTorp and Zero Rush, two very hype people to watch, um, both for skill and, of course, contributions to the community as well. Um, and then, of course, at 11 p.m., we also have a Super Metroid race um, on this channel as well. Uh, so if you're looking for the next race in this series, that is uh, Saturday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. Apologies, Christos, um, on the other continent in the world, not North America, uh, having to deal with our Eastern Time. Uh, hey, standards. I'm used to it by this point. <laughs> We greatly appreciate that here in the Eastern Seaboard. Uh, but I think that's about everything I have. Um, I will give the 
last um, opportunity for a word here, though, to Hippo. Um, anything you'd like to say out to your fans out there looking for game two? Rip me. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> uh, I guess we'll just see. Time will tell. No, that's all good. Uh, GG, uh, thank you to both commentators. I uh, hope you guys uh, get lots of attention for this because you got a big audience and uh, you guys do good work and you deserve the follows and uh, and all the attention you get. So uh, thanks for everybody for putting this on. Uh, thank you. A lot of people, yeah, put this on. Uh, not to go without, you know, Oski Card Tracker, um, you know, helps us to keep track of the items in the stream. You know, the restream, there's a lot of work that goes into the production, uh, you know, obviously. Two commentators, two racers, you know, very easy to see and identify with them, but a lot goes into it. So, you know, definitely, you know, show them your love and support. Uh, it can be a thankless job a lot of the time. You know, you did a very good job mentioning speed gaming channels, you know, got some Super Metroid, got some Zelda, you know, some Mega Man, some Celeste. So definitely check out the speed gaming schedule, you know, if uh, you know, you're know looking forward to that. You already mentioned the next match, Saturday, 6 p.m. Eastern. And uh, yeah, for my part, I've been Gassel, and, uh, Thank you, everyone, for everything. And, you know, thank you to my co commentator It was a lot of fun. Thank you uh, for joining me today, Giselle Schaft. And also a big shout out to Hereditaman doing the solo commentary on Speed Gaming Espanol. That's right, we are multilingual now. Uh, we have oh, a yeah. Spanish restream, a German restream, and a French restream. Uh, we do need more people, though. So if you speak any of those languages and would like to assist, uh, get a hold of us on the Speed Gaming Discord. Great place to, uh, you know, get more information regarding that. Um, that about does it for us today, though. Um, I've been Eudaimonistic, joined by Giselle Schaft. Um, it's been a pleasure to have the opportunity to commentate for you folks, and we're looking forward to seeing you next time. So uh, with that, I'll close this out. Uh, we'll see you next mission. Bye.